evangelist is to come alongside of your pastor and help to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying the body of Christ. So we all come to unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man to measure the statues of fullness of Christ. Amen? Being no more children tossed to and bro full by every wind of doctrine, being deceived by those who lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love and growing up in him in all things. whom the whole body fitly joined together compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love the whole body every one of us fitly joined together and we've been joined together in union the moment we got saved, placed in the body of Christ, compacted by that which every joint supplies. God has bringing, given every one of us something to come to the table with, beginning with his time. We need to redeem it. His talents or gifts, we use them to edify each other, help each other become like Christ. His treasures. They're not ours. And I'm guilty. I'm convicted. So let me move on. To help build up the body, to edify the body. Spiritually, help each other become like Christ. Numerically, to bring others to the body. Physically. When you need to make the physical body bigger to start that, start that whole process again. And that's what I heard from my brother today. I, I'd like to be accepted as an honorary member of this church. No, I'm, no, I'm, don't, don't laugh, I'm serious. I already am, if, in case you don't know it. You, you probably think I'm not because I'm a brother from another mother, but listen, we got the same yeah. daddy. You understand that? Amen. You know, I'm a part of every church that I go into especially those that, that minister to us the way that they do. That brother right there, he's one of my pastors. And he, 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 I'm glad he doesn't know the anointing that God's got in his life because he'd probably have a fat head. <laughs> and be careful with me because I can spread a net for your feet. And I don't want to do that. You know, even what you said to me today, the last thing you said to me is I struggled with putting a message together. I didn't know I had left a message at church. But you said, Tony, keep it simple. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eva. <laughs> that, and that's how she kisses me, you know. But anyhow, and I heard that. And so that's what we're going to do. And I, 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 I said that in, in, in reference to being out of here on time, too. So if I have to condense, I'll condense. The opening prayer. We're going to read, and then we're going to pray. Philippians, you don't have to turn there. But if you, if you want, you can. Philippians chapter 1, and these are the words of the Apostle Paul, and, and I choose them, and they, he didn't write them, the Holy Spirit did, he just spoke to them. And Paul and Timotheus, the servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, and I really do, speaking to you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. I pray for you every day. Beginning with Kevin, Phil, and Dale. What a, what a joy it was to be under his ministry today. One of the reasons that I'm excited about hearing Dale is he mentored that young man there and many others of you. And even, even uh, my missions pastor, Don Curran. Let me move on. 
Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now. Being confident this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that work is to conform us to the image of Christ. Hold that thought. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, ye are partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer, the same as Paul's, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That you would live a life that is characterized by charity. Isn't that what you want, brother? That's your vision. that you may, be, may, may approve those things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Paul prayed another prayer that I'm going to pray before we get started. Well, as we continue, because this is all part of the message, folks. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us with might by your spirit in the inner man so that Christ would would dwell or, or abide or, Lord, feel at home in our hearts. That we might be rooted and grounded in love, being, ab being able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of your love. And that we might know by experience the love of Christ with passage knowledge as a result of being filled with all the fullness of God. So that God will do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think through the power of the spirit that's already at work in us, to the praise of his glory. God, help me to yield to your spirit, to abide in you, so you, might, would, it be an, you would enable me to motivate, challenge, and encourage. First of all, my family, my sweet wife, 42 years. It's taken me 42 years to learn that too often I put ministry not only before her. Guys, don't, young pastor, be careful. And she told me, Tony, you put ministry before God, and neither one of us like it. She, the only one she's going to take second fiddle to. Malachi talks about that. Don't bring God to your garbage. I'm not going to receive it. The thing he wants most is your heart. The thing she wants most from me, believe it or not, is my heart. And she knows how filthy it is. That's a God thing. One of the things I vowed to do by God's grace And I trust that she'll do the same thing. It's to renew our commitment or our vows to put no, no one or nothing else before each other. But God, first. by loving one another and God the way Jesus did. You notice one another. I was, this is part of the message I tell people when they, I sing a lot going, anyhow. Brother, did you hear me when you left today over at Cracker Barrel? They gave me the mic and I sang. They asked me to sing. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. I messed up, and so they let me, let me do it over. They let me do a do-over. I'll sing the same song before I leave, if I have time. <laughs> but I want to open with this song, Take Time to Be Holy, even as I said earlier today. Uh, the Lord said, be ye holy as I am holy. 
Holiness is Christ's likeness. It's not self-righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness, amen, that, he, that we receive as a gift from him the moment we get saved. We're talking about true holiness. We're not talking about, you know, a, a, a counterfeit holiness that we try to achieve through our standards. And standards are not wrong as long as God has given you the standards. Come on, somebody. Righteousness and true holiness. Holiness is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why this song? Because it tells us how to be like Christ. How? To abide in him. What does it mean to abide in him? Listen closely. Is I, uh, here, here we go. To abide in Christ is to begin by getting saved and then continue to remain in close fellowship with him. How long? I'm glad you asked. Until he enables you or empowers you to bear. We can't produce it. Bear the only fruit his spirit produces. We can't produce it, but he can. The only fruit his spirit produces, the likeness of Jesus. His love, his joy, his peace, his long-suffering, his gentleness, his goodness, his faith, his meekness, his temperance. The fruit of the Spirit is Christ-likeness. You know this song? You sing this song? And what I'm asking you to do is just to meditate on the words of this song, please. Please. Help me, Jesus. Take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting and nothing is blessing to see. Take time to be holy or like Christ. Let the world rushes on. Listen, spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shall be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever betides. In spite of people, places, predicaments, pain, in the valley, on the mountaintop. And by the way, you're going to spend more time in the valley, in God's process of conforming you to the image of Christ. He knows what he's doing. Whatever be time, in joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Last verse. Take time to be holy. Be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love. Thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Pastor, you've prayed for me. I'd like to ask the congregation just to take maybe a silent moment. Would you pray for myself and pray for your, you as God leads? Would you do that? And I'll break the silence. Oh, God. 
Oh, God. Dear Lord, have mercy. Oh, God. Use me, dear God, for the work you've called me. not so much that you want me to protect the seeds on my own, but you want me and my brother, Dale, Phil, preachers, teachers, husbands, wives, children, mothers, to surrender to you so that you can do the perfecting through us in the process of perfecting us. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. The title and text of our message really is found in the same place. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, Either were already perfect, but I follow after if I, I may apprehend that for which also I have apprehended of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say this, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended or arrived, but this one thing, keep that in mind, this one thing, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do, the Apostle Paul came to a place in his life where he became very, very content in Jesus or with Jesus. He came to a place in his life where he said, listen, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, total dependence of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, that's, that's Paul's way of defining the, uh, the uh, abiding relationship. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Paul said, listen, as he, as he, he went uh, down his resume in the early part of that chapter, and he talked about the things he accomplished, uh, not only in, in Christ, but in, in the world. And he came to a place of conclusion. He said, listen, you know what? Uh, I, I, all, all those things that I've ever accomplished, all those things that I've ever done, I count them dung. What is a dung? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell them, Pastor. All the BMs, the bowel movements, Refuge, I count them all but done that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is by the law, but the righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. He said, I count it all but loss. He said, all the, all, the, all, the, all the successes that I had in life. How many of you know that when you, when, you, when you focus on your successes and, you know, they can hold you back because they might think that you, you've done enough and, you, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to press towards Christ like this. That you've arrived. This is easy. He said, I, I count all my failures. Any successes, baby, that I've had as a, as a husband, as a father. And it's time I can't think of many. Because my priorities were too, too off. Trying to establish my own righteousness as opposed to crisis. Forget those things which are behind. Any successes. Forget those things that are behind, those failures, because they'll hold you back. And that's exactly where the devil wants you to be. He wants you to be on both ends of the spectrum. Forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press. I'm diligently seeking the Lord. I press towards the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God. There's no higher calling of God than for us to be, to, to, to be Christ-like. In Christ Jesus. The great message that Brother Dale Nugent preached on today. 
through experiences in his own life. In one of the verses, that, one of the key verses, Romans 8, 28 and 29, we all know all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate or predetermine to conform them to the image of Christ. The Lord's ultimate vision, his ultimate goal, his ultimate plan, his ultimate purpose for your life is to conform you to the very image that he, that he created the first man, Adam, in. And when Adam, when Adam sinned against God and died spiritually to God, his spirit wasn't dead to Satan, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how he walked according to the course of this world, according to the spirit of the, uh, of the, of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. How many of you know, how many of you know, folks, if you, I didn't mean to go down there, but let me go there for a minute. If you are not controlled by the spirit of God, you're controlled by the spirit of Satan. According to the word of God. Or say, well, I was quick and I've been saved. And listen, there's a lot of Christians, man. You can never tell they're saved. And there's a lot of who confess that they are and they're not. And one day Jesus is going to say to them, I say this, I say this tearfully. Because I don't want anybody to have to face it, but it's going to happen. He's going to say, depart from me because I never knew you. Where am I going with this? When Adam fell and he died spiritually and we inherited his sin nature by virtue of him being our ancestor and his seed being corrupted. We were dead spiritually. We were born spiritually dead. We must be born again. Must be born from above. Must be born of the spirit. Why? So God can recreate us into his likeness and his image. God's at work in the life of every Christian to do that. I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18, and brother, you can turn there because I don't want to take time to go there, but I, I'm just paraphrasing a little bit. It talks about how if you're saved, God, God conforms us day by day to, to the image of his son by the spirit. Now, the Lord is that spirit. How? Glad you asked. Through all of life's circumstances. You just have to trust him that he's at work, and he's going to complete it to the day until Jesus Christ comes. One day, we are gonna be, we're going to be changed into the image, according to Philippians, and we're right there. Why don't we turn there? Holy Spirit, so good. <clears throat> Even if he didn't do that, but anyhow, he did. For our, con our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He's able to change us. He's the work, is in the process of changing us right now. We mar the process, but we don't cooperate. And the only way that we can be like Christ in this life, in the process of the Lord conforming us, is we must abide in him right now. We must begin that relationship by getting saved, then continue to remain in close fellowship with Jesus until he enables us to bear the only fruit that his spirit produces. And that's the likeness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Day by day. You sung that song today, this morning, constantly abiding. Stay right there. Staying close. And don't let the devil derail you. Because he'll try. Day by day.
the ultimate goal, the vision, the purpose, God's plan for our lives should be our ultimate goal. Our vision, our plan. Do you know why? Because it's a vision, it's, it's a goal, it's a purpose that the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is teaching. Be ye holy as I am holy. Be you Christ-like. Abide in him. If you don't abide in him, Christian, if you're saved, and you can't abide in him unless you're saved, You'll become like a withered branch on the vine. That doesn't mean you lose your salvation because you can't. But you may feel that way. You won't have, you won't experience Christ's life flowing through you. You know how you can tell? You live a very self-centered life. You'll, you won't be seek, you won't be, you won't have a desire to seek God's kingdom, his right. You will, you will try to seek your own. I know that because I've been there. You know, those times where I, I, I allow myself to go, and I, I, I choose to go into, sometimes you, you can choose to go into a depression state. Now, I'm not mocking anybody that, that's, that, that really has experienced this whole concept of anxiety and depression. I've been diagnosed being bipolar, and I'm saying, you must be out of your mind. Well, every one of us has extreme highs and extreme lows. And some of, them are, some of us have higher highs and lower lows than others. Well, I'm one of them. But I do know this. When I'm abiding in him, he balances me out. And if I listen to him, when I start getting too high and start slowing down, unless I cross the line, then I might have to take some meds. But when I get too low, just like you were saying, brother, I can't repeat everything you said, and I need to hurry up because I, I got a money trail going here. But we need look, we look at your stream sometimes. Should you take medicine? Shouldn't you take medicine? Let me leave that alone. Brother, you have to explain that to him again. Brother Dale, you know what I'm talking about. Is he here? If you're here, brother, say amen. Okay, good. What am I trying to say here is this. I almost lost my train of thought. When I'm abiding in him, God deals with the deceptive highs and the debilitating lows. He might not always do it when I want, but as I pray for God to, to deliver me, I finally heard from him, no, for my grace is sufficient, for my strength, my power, is by it made perfect in your weakness. <laughs> and I don't do this every day, but when I'm abiding in him, I say, well, I would rather, I would rather glory in my infirmity. I would rather glory in my necessities, in persecutions, in everything, just knowing that this is going to help me to, 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 to experience God's strength. As he brings me to that place, of abiding in him. In spite of people, places, predicaments, and pain. In, in, in spite of circumstances, good and bad. Move on, Tony. Why does God want us to abide in him? Your, your pastor spoke to my spirit. And repeating a, a phrase that I preached, a message I preached a few years ago, maybe a year ago, two years ago. And the message was entitled, The Ultimate Intimate Relationship. The reason why God created us and the reason why he wants to recreate us is so that we can experience the ultimate intimate relationship with him. The relationship that is the epitome of all other relationships. <clears throat> the relationship that God the Father and the God the Son and God the Spirit shares with each other. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 says, these three are one. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. It means that they are experiencing the greatest relationship anyone can ever have. It's a oneness. 
They're living, they're, 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 they're sharing, the mutual sharing of their life with each other. That's true Christian fellowship. A relation, uh, 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 um, um, slow down. An ultimate interrelationship that is the essence of Christianity. Let's go to the scripture here real quickly. John chapter 17. Guys, I'm going to warn you. I might be five minutes over, but I was told that if the Holy Spirit leads me, and I, I trust that's him. If not, just pray for me. I got to get my kids to bed too, man, and I got to get some of that cake. The ultimate intimate relationship with the Lord is the essence of Christianity, the reason why he saved us. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is life eternal. This is what life eternal is all about, that they might know thee, uh, 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 the only true God in, in, in Jesus Christ is whom thou hast sent. How closely does he want us to know him? Look at John chapter 17, verse 20. As he talks about, he prays for himself in the first uh, uh, part of this uh, book, or this chapter. Then he prays for the disciples of his day. And now he's praying for us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they may all be one as, you see that oneness there? That they may be one as thou, thou Father, and art Art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Watch this oneness here. I'm, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me. The reason why you go to heaven, because of this prayer where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world have not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare that the love with which thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. The essence of Christ Christianity is salvation. Listen, God does not primarily save us to It'll help us to escape hell. What a fringe benefit. But he wants to conform us to the image of his son that we might experience this ultimate intimate relationship with him, the love relationship that is the epitome of all other relationships, the essence of Christianity, which is exemplified by Christ in your humanity. John chapter 14, I'm trying to turn there, but well, Philip came up to him and he said, listen, Lord, would you, would you suffice us? Would you satisfy us? Would you simply tell us who you are? And Jesus said, Philip, how long have you time you've been with me? Don't you know who I am? He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why didn't you ask me then, where is the, who is the Father? And he said, well, listen, Philip, the things that I say, the works that I do, it's not me. It's the Father who's living his life through me. He exemplified this type of relationship. Then he goes on to say, listen, you know, by the way, Philip, the same works that I do, you shall be able to do them. We all will be able to do them because I go to the Father. And I'll be living my life through you. It's a, the ultimate intimate relationship is a relationship that is defined by Jesus as an abiding relationship in John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is a husbandman. Every branch of me that beareth fruit... He, 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 he takes it away. And every branch that beareth not fruit, he purges it. It might bring forth more fruit. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, not you. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, he the one who begins to, uh, uh, to con uh, continue to remain in close relationship with me. How close? Close enough to allow me to live my life through you. Just the way a natural branch depends totally completely on the natural vine. Daily surrender, moment by moment, surrender to Jesus, allowing him to have the seat of the throne of your heart. <coughs> Without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch and is withered, men gather him and cast him into the fire, they burn. You live a, 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 a fruitless life, like a withered branch. 
we don't abide, if we don't continue to remain in Christ, in his word, in prayer, in the spirit. It's a relationship that the Lord encourages us to experience. In Revelation 3, you know where I'm going. 20, he said, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man or any woman would hear me knocking and open the door of their heart to me, I will come into him or her and sup or have fellowship with him. If you would open the door of your heart daily so that Jesus can come in, would you ask him to cleanse your heart and create in you a clean heart, a renew? Ask him daily, man, three times a day like Daniel did and David did. He'll come in and be seated at the throne of your heart. If you have the faith of a child, my two granddaughters, Six and seven got saved this year. Do I believe it? You bet your life. Mama taught me. She got saved when she was four. Do I believe it? I was there. I saw it. I see it today. In her. I stand at the door and knock. Let me give you a charge in closing. Your number one goal in life should be the same one as God's is. Otherwise, you're going to seek something else first, and you'll be deceived by the devil. I'm just telling you the way it is, in love. The greatest sin any Christian could commit is not to abide in Christ. Why do I say that? Because you can do nothing without him, but you can do all things through Christ. I like the verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. It says, he that abideth in him sinneth not. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that means, among other things perhaps, that anyone that abides in Christ, the closer you are to Christ, the less you're going to sin. Dale, you know how we used to say back in the day? These young folks, they, they might not know this. They might have heard it a different way. Sin will keep you from fellowship with God, or fellowship with God will keep you from sin. I want to leave you with one thing, one charge. This one thing I do, forget those things which are behind. Some of us get caught up in our failures. Can't go forward. Some of us get caught up in our success. Then. Well, I did this and I did that. And I, what have you done lately? The best thing you can do <laughs> is to forget those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, pressed towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Christ-likeness. And by the way, <laughs> it's not just my job and his job to help others become like Christ. It's all of our jobs. <laughs> By pulling all of our resources together that God has given us. Discipleship making. Christ like making. You getting this, young man? We're going to have a test afterward. <laughs> you answer the right question, you can have some cake. But anyhow, <laughs> my wife said, Yeah, right. <laughs> You're all welcome to cake. <laughs> she don't need it. Let me get serious. At least I didn't walk. I'm almost done. That's the challenge. How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. I got a, I got a present. I'm going to leave you a gift. It coincides with this. How do we, how in the world are we going to help each other become like Jesus? I'm glad you asked. You're going to have to put feet on charity. 
You have to walk in love. Your life is going to have to be characterized by the love of God. And listen, remembering that charity begins at home. Those are the training grounds. Teach each other how to love one another, you know, uh, by example and by being obedient to the word of God. How practical is this? I'm glad you asked. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you and she also love one another. How can you express this Christ-like love? I'm, almost, I'm done, brother. I'm stepping down. So you can step up. <laughs> to one another. Come on up. Then I'll blame you for any more time. Watch this. Now, these are in color. They're in color. They're in the back, and you can frame these. Okay? But this is going to help you to love one another. Practically, but spiritually. Be willing to wash one another's feet, symbolizing Christ-like service. Be kind and affectionate with, with brotherly love to one another. In honor, prefer one another. Be of the same mind. I mean, this works with husband and wife. Be of the same mind and, and have compassion for one another. Don't maliciously judge one another. The scripture reference is right here. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Perceive one another as Christ also received you. Be able to admonish one another. Have the same care for one another. By love, serve one another. Don't bite, devour, nor or consume one another. Don't be prideful, provoking, or envying one another. Bear one another's burdens. Be humble, meek, patient, and forbearing to love one another. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving one, uh, to one another. Be submissive to one another. Lie not to one another. Admonish one another. Let your love grow for one another. Comfort one another. Uh, there's about 40 references there, specifically. to call upon him and ask him to save you. The moment you do, you begin that journey of being made by Christ. And if you don't, it's only because you're deceived by the 